Today, we wrap up our series on seeking God for a breakthrough. If you've been with us in the last four or five weeks, thank you for being with us. But what do you do when you already have prayed, you've fasted, and the breakthrough has not happened yet? Now, the reason why I want to deal with this is because of all the mysteries about prayer. There are a lot of them, and there are a lot of mysteries about prayer that I do not understand myself. I don't always understand how it works with the sovereignty of God and the will of men when you're praying for other people and when they have their own free will. I don't understand it all, and I'll be honest with you. I've, ta I've talked about prayer. I've learned about prayer. I've learned about prayer from my dad from my mom, from all the great preachers out there, but there's still some things I don't understand. Now, I know for one is this, that one of the things in our spiritual journey that discourage or even get believers to be cold-hearted in their faith is unanswered prayer and delayed answer to our prayers. Now, I know that God said, just do it, pray. Ask. He says it over and over, 20 times in the New Testament. He says, ask. I want you to ask. You have not because you ask not. 
Now, since our Heavenly Father loves us, we know that. And since we know that He wants to answer our prayer, He's commanded us to ask for pray- in prayer. He has given us multiple promises about prayer. And He says He is eager to meet our needs. That's what we talk about in seeking uh, a, for a breakthrough in the last four weeks. The question then is this. Then why do I have to pray more than one time? If God is so eager that he wants me to pray, why do I have to pray more than once? Why do I have to make the same request over and over to God? If I want, if if I want what I'm asking for in prayer, and if God is clearly loving, and as we saw in the last message, he's never going to give something bad, that he's never going to give you something detrimental for you, he's never going to give you something that is harmful or unhelpful, but he will always give you what's good and what's best. He will never give you a bad gift. That's one thing we learned the last four weeks. Now, here's the point. If God wants to do that in my life, why do I have to ask multiple times? Now, if you've been around your spiritual journey for quite some time, you know this. One prayer sometimes doesn't get the answer. As a matter of fact, can I say this? Honestly, as a pastor, as someone who loves the people I serve, there are some people where I'm saying, God, that sister, that brother has been praying for years. When are you going to answer their prayer? You say, you know, Jesus said, we looked at this last week. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Now, that's a mystery to me. And it's a mystery to a lot of people. Why can't I just say one time and then God gives it? He knows what I need anyways. Now, the Bible many times talks about being persistent in prayer. One example is a verse that Paul wrote in Colossians 4 to on top of your outline. It says, be persistent in prayer. In other words, keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. Don't just pray one time about something, but keep on praying. And then it says, be persistent in prayer and keep alert as you pray. In other words, don't fall into repetitious, mindless prayer. I think, I think we all agree in this. When you begin to repeat yourself in prayer, you're praying about the same thing, it begins to be monotonous. It begins to be, you begin to just repeat mindless prayer. Persistent prayer can lead to heartless, mindless, repetitious prayer. I've experienced that. I don't know about you. He's saying pray persistently, but it means when you pray, be present. We talked about this last week. Feel it. Pray with emotion. Pray with sincerity. And then he said this, keep alert as you pray, always giving thanks to God. Now, we've looked four times at prayer, and every time it adds, give thanks when you are asking. We're asking about the future. But he says, always be grateful for what God has already given you. Now, why do I have to pray and ask over and over? Does God have to be cajoled, cajoled or, or be pestered? Or does I, do I have to bother God? Do I have to wear God down? Do I have to beg and beg and bribe and plead and cry? And bother God until finally God knows, okay, fine, enough already. Be quiet, shut up. Okay, I'm going to give it to you. Is that the kind of God we are praying to? Is that the kind of God that we are called to ask and bring our needs to? The answer to that, absolutely not, right? That is not all the reason. God says, I want you to ask multiple times. And it's not to remind me, it's not to pe- pester me, but it is, not to pester me, but it is for our benefit. In fact, we're going to look at two stories today that Jesus told that teaches the exact opposite of that idea. When I was growing, my dad said, you have to keep praying, you have to keep praying, you have to pray. How many times did you pray? And I used to remember, I would tell my dad, that's too much. Why can't God answer after like two, three times? Why do you have to keep praying it? Now, we're going to look at a story that Jesus told us 
and told his disciples and teach the exact opposite of that idea that I have to wear down, wear God down, that I have to keep pestering and bargaining and bribing, and then finally God goes, okay, fine, I'll just give it to you. Now, in fact, Jesus told not one, but two stories, two parables that teaches the exact opposite thing. The two stories we're going to look at today, they're going to be brief. They're actually very short. Actually, they're contrasting. God is saying, I am not like that person in that story that, that I'm telling you right now. Now, the first one is found in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, and I, I don't have time to go over the whole details about it, but I'd like for you to check it out on your own when you have your Bible. It's the story of the persistent friend. Now, do you remember when the disciples came to Jesus and Jesus teaches how to pray? After Jesus taught the disciples the Lord's Prayer, he then tells them this story, and here's what it says. It says, but then he said to them, suppose you went to your neighbor's house at midnight and knock on his door, and, uh, and, and, and you said to your neighbor, an out-of-town guest has just arrived in my place. He's hungry, and I've got nothing to feed him, so I need to borrow three loaves of bread. Would you do that? I would not do that with my neighbor. Wake him up in the middle of the night. Now, this is the persistent neighbor. Now, notice the next part of the verse. Your neighbor would probably whisper from the inside of this house, don't bother me. That door's locked already, and we're already asleep. You know, back in the days, they sleep, and the, all the children are sleeping right next to them, and the dad sleeps by, basically uh, on one side, and all the children, all the family are sleeping. He's saying, this is, this is, this is, outrageous. We're already sleeping. Or maybe he's talking out in the window. Now notice, it says the door is already locked for the night. We are all in bed. This is the, this is the guy who owns the, the house. I cannot wake up everybody just to help you. Now he says, but even though he would not help you out of friendship at that particular moment, if you keep persistently knocking on his door, he's going to get up and he's going to give you what you need because of your persistence. Now, Jesus, he says, I tell you this. This is the parable of contrast, the story of contrast. He said this, keep on asking and you'll get it. Keep on seeking and you will find it. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receive, and everyone who seek will find. If you keep on knocking, the door will be open to you. Now, just in case we didn't get that message, he says, I'm going to give you another story just to prove that even this, this guy responded to his friend, not out of good heart, but he just wanted to get him out of his hair. He says the principle there is you should keep knocking, keep asking, and keep seeking. Jesus wants you so badly to understand that, why we should pray about something more than once, that he doesn't only give us one story, he gives us two stories. Now, the second story, you'll find this in Luke chapter 18, verse 1 to 8. Now, this is called the story of the persistent widow. Again, I'm going to just summarize it. Similar theme. One day, it's a different day. Jesus told his disciples another story to illustrate that they should always keep on praying and never give up. Here's the story. He said there was, once a, there was once a big city judge, Jesus says, who didn't care all about God or he didn't care about people. But there was this early elderly widow who kept coming to this judge over and over, pleading for the judge to protect her right and do something about the man who cheated her. Now it says there, for a long time, this judge ignored her plea. Think about that. For a long time, this judge ignored her plea. The judges ignored her pleas for help, but eventually he had enough. He thought to himself, oh, you know, even though I don't care about, uh, I don't care all about what God or what this woman think, I'm tired of her pestering requests. So I'm just going to see that she gets justice just to get her to be quiet and stop bothering me. Now, if you notice those two stories, the same theme as the other story. Now, here's what 
the Bible says, here's, here's what Jesus said. Then the Lord said, now learn a lesson from this uncaring judge. He says, okay, guys, get the point here. Even if that corrupt, uncaring judge eventually gave in to the woman's request, won't God, who loves you deeply, surely give you what is right if you keep crying out to him day and night? Now, Jesus tells two stories to teach the exact same truth. Why should we never give up praying for something? Now, here's the contrast. He says, God listens to you. God cares. And God wants to answer even if people don't want to answer you. God wants to answer. He says, God is not like either of those, not the friend and not the judge. Because he listens and he cares. The point is this, my friend, that God is eager to answer your requests and your prayers. Now, why then Why then doesn't God answer my prayer for the first time? Why does God want me to be persistent? Well, the Bible gives us a number of reasons. And none of them have to do with trying to convince God, begging God, or God playing hard to get. No, nothing of those. Why? Because the Bible tells us all through Scripture that God already knows what we need even before we ask. So that's not why you have to ask persistently, right? Now, there are, there are a number of other reasons. Number one is this. When I ask God persistently, it keeps my attention focused on God. When you pray about something over and over, you give God your attention. Now, one of the reasons God loved King David in the Old Testament of the Bible, even though he committed a sin, even though he committed adultery and murder and all that other stuff, one of the reasons God loved King David in the Old Testament of the Bible is because David gave God his attention not once a day, all the time. Look at this verse in Psalms 25, 15. David says, my eyes are what? Continually looking to the Lord. Wow. That's another word for persistent. I am continually looking to the Lord for help, for he alone can rescue me from all the traps in my life. You know what? As we're waking, waiting for a breakthrough in our life, oh my goodness, there's a lot of traps that can come to our life. People, you know, when we're waiting for God to answer our prayer and it's not kind of delivering it, oh, we like to take shortcuts. We like to take the easy cuts. Or we hear all these voices. And David said, hey, I have learned to look to God continually. And he, 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 he rescued me from all the traps. You know what? You're going to have a lot of traps in your life this coming week. And the Bible says God is the only one who knows them in advance. God can see what we cannot see. He can see the traps we're going and we're walking into next year, next this week, or next month, or in the next 10 10 years. He says, focus on me continually and I will show you how to be rescued from all the traps. Psalms 105, 4 says, look to the Lord for his strength. Seek his face constantly. How often? Constantly. It keeps my attention focused on God. When I keep praying and I keep asking, God wants me to keep asking because it keeps my attention focused on Him. So let me ask you a question. Do you talk to God more often when you need something? I don't know about you, but I do. When I have a big need in my life, it seems like I, 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 I keep going to God. I talk to God more often than when I don't need anything. Now, if you never needed anything, would you talk to God as often? Honestly, I find myself, no. It seems like my prayer gets more intense and more emotional and more frequent when I am in dire need of something. Now, when do you, uh, when do you talk to God the most? Isn't it true when we're in deep pain? Keeps us focused on God continually. Now, there's a second reason why God wants us to ask continually, continuously. It's because having to wait teaches me about myself. You know, when you're going through a breakthrough and and you're praying, God, you know, please answer this prayer, and, and there's no answer. Did you know that that waiting actually teaches me about 
myself. It teaches you about yourself. You're going to learn some things while you're waiting for a breakthrough. And while you are praying for an answer that you will never learn any other way. This is going to be a mind-opening message for some of you because you learn not just about God. You're going to learn about yourself when, when you don't get everything you want instantly. Some prayers are answered immediately. I see that as a pastor. I see that all my life. There's some healing that happened instantly, immediately. But I've seen some prayer requests that are taking weeks and months and years and decades now, two of the most important prayers I'm still praying for have not been answered yet. Now, I've seen in my own life, I prayed for things and God answered maybe in one year, in one month, in one week. Some, some prayers get answered immediately. But I have two of the most important prayers right down my life. I'm still praying. Now, why is it taking so long? Here's what I found out. Because while I am working on that prayer to God, God is working on me. Now, there are a number of tests that happens when you pray about something over and over that reveals more about you. Now, notice this verse in Zechariah 39. It stays there. God says, I will test and purify them. That, that's, of course, the children of Israel, but the, the principle is this applies to us too, right? I will test and purify them. I will test and purify them. A silver is purified by fire. Ever wondered when you're going through the fire, why you're going through it? It's for testing and purification. And then it says in that verse, I will test them as gold is tested. Think about that. I will test them as gold is tested. Now, how do you test gold? You put it in a vat and you heat it up until it gets so, so hot. I think it was like, what, 1,104 or 1,400 degrees Celsius that all the impurities are burned up. I mean, that is really, really hot. Now, get this. Both gold and silver are purified by fire. This precious, precious uh, gold, uh, silver and gold are purified by fire. Now he says, and then after I've tested them, after I purify them, notice the next part of the verse. It says, then they will pray to me and I will answer. Now, I've heard a lot of teachings and I've even done t some teaching about purification and all that stuff. God brings us to the fire. God purifies us to take out the impurities and, and separate the shafts in our life so that we can be pure. But many people miss this, this last part of the verse. Then they will pray to me and I will answer. Notice that prayer answered, prayer answered comes after the test. I'll repeat that. Notice in that verse, that answered prayer comes after the test. God is going to test you before he blesses you. I mean, we love the blessing. We love all the, the blessing that God wants, but, but we don't like the test. But he says there, I'm going to test you. In this test, you're going to learn a lot about yourself. If, you're going to, if, if you give up praying, you're never going to learn these lessons. And, 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 and like what I said, this is going to be mind-blowing for many of us. The truth of the matter is, I've always heard teaching about answering prayer, God answers prayer, being purified by gold. But here's what I, what I did not, I missed, at least for me I missed, that God will test me first before he blesses me. We never really hear that. We always like the prayer of God bless, God will bless you, God will bless you, God will give you what you need. But we never learn this principle that God tests us before he blesses us. Well, let me just mention four areas that God wants me to grow and wants you to grow. The first would be this. Praying persistently actually tests my desires. What does that mean? What do I really want? Have you ever, have you ever brought a kid? I have 
three sons. And I remember one of my kids, we'd go to the store, he'd go around, he'd go straight to the toy store, the, the toy area, and he would point, I want this, I want this, I want this, and I want it. But I noticed that every time he moves, he would get one, and he would leave and say, no, I want this. And by the time we get to the end, I'm like, okay, you've got two seconds to pick what you really want, and that's it. And you should see him. He's running back and forth in the aisle, kind of confused, Mom, you're giving me stress. I don't know what I want. And I thought, wow, how many of us are just like that? Like my son, when you start praying, and many of you are praying for a breakthrough, you're going to find that actually your prayer evolves and it changes and it grows and it develops because you're going to see, oh God, wow, that's not what I really want. What I really want is this or that. Or maybe, God, oh, I changed my mind. Have you ever experienced that? I have. See, praying persistently tests my desires. What I really want. Now, everybody has desires. And the reason you have desire is because God puts that desire in your heart. That desire in your heart. God, I want to be successful. I want to be rich. I want to be, I want to excel in my career. That's a great desire. And guess what? Many of us do not realize this, but God actually placed that desire there. But here's the warning. A desire can be misused and it can be abused. It can be, and we've seen that. A desire can be perverted. Now, there are good desires in your life and there are bad desires in your life. And many times we don't know the difference. So we just ask, God, I want to marry this person. God, I love this career. But when you pray persistently, those desires begin to go through a filtering moment start to filter out and you begin to realize this is a good desire or this is not a good desire. Persistent praying shows the difference between a whim and a deep desire. Now look at this next verse. It's an amazing verse in Psalm 37, 4. It's a great promise. It says, take delight in the Lord. That's the desire thing, right? And he will give you, what? The desires of your heart. Friends, can I say this? And even for those of us who are in this journey for quite some time, let's remind ourselves that God is not stingy. He's actually waiting on us. The, the formula there is, are we really delighting ourselves in God? Are we paying attention to God? And many of us miss that. Now, here's the second thing it tests. When, we, when, when, when we're waiting for a breakthrough, here's what it tests us. Praying persistently tests my priorities. What's most important to me? It tests my priorities. When I have to pray for something more than once, it's not like I'm convincing God to do it. He already is waiting to give it. He just wants to know what is really my priority? What is really important to my life? That's the question. What's most important in your life? When you pray about something, it tends to clarify what's important to you. If you don't pray about it, obviously it's not important. Isn't it right? If you do pray about it, it obviously is important. Now, if you pray about it once, maybe it's not really a priority. But when you repeatedly pray about it, then chances are it really matters to you. If it's not worth praying about repeatedly, then it's not really a priority. By the way, do you know how to know what's important to you? Do you know what's really, what really matters to you? You know what's important to you. The question is what you worry about most. You'll know what's important to you by thinking, what do I worry about the most? See, worry tells what's important to you, to your life. If you worry about it, apparently it is very important. See, worry all you want, and it won't change anything, but pray all you want. That will change everything. In fact, Jesus gets right to the point in the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew 6, 32 and 33. He says this, maybe, may, why, why be like unbelievers? He says, why be like unbelievers who worry about everything? And Jesus is saying, they don't have a heavenly father who loves them and who takes care of them. And that's why they worry and worry. Why should you be like them? 
Then he said this, your heavenly father already knows. Circle that. Already knows all your needs. You're not convincing God. You're not even notifying God. You're not even saying, God, I want you to know this is my need. Notice what Jesus said. Your heavenly father already knows your need. And he will give you all you need. Now here's the premise. If your first concern is to live for his kingdom. First concern. What is that? That's called priority. Praying persistently test is my priority. Now when your priorities are right, God says, I will say yes if your priority is right. Really? You say, well, I'm waiting on God to answer my prayer, Pastor Phoebe. Are you waiting on God? Or is God really waiting on you? Maybe he wants to test your desire. Maybe he wants to test your priority. Maybe he really wants to know what's really important in your life. Now look at this next verse in Psalms 84, 11. This is an amazing promise. It said there, no good thing will, uh, will the Lord withhold from those who do what is right. No good thing will the Lord withhold from those who do what is right. Wow. God says, you know what? Your priorities are right. You're living for me. Your attention is with me. You're staying connected with me. My word abides in you. And you're connected with me. My kingdom is your number one priority. Guess what? Anything you ask. Wow. I don't know about you, but seriously, that puts a lot of question in my heart. God, could it be possible that my life is not aligned? Could it be possible that I am not really giving you my full attention. Because notice what that verse is. No good thing will I withhold from those who walk uprightly. And that's why I said earlier, there is nothing, almost nothing, God will give the man or woman who is totally committed to Jesus Christ. He says, no good thing will the Lord withhold from those who do what is right. That leads me to ask this question. Ah, what is out of order in my life? What are my priorities? God says, no good thing will I withhold from those who do what is right. Now, here's the third test, what it shows about myself. Persistent praying tests my maturity. Now, this is a big one. When God doesn't give me something, when God doesn't give me something immediately, He's actually testing my maturity, and he's doing that to you too. He's testing your character. He's testing your responsibility. He's testing whether you're grown up or, or you're, you're stuck or you're, you're, you're not really moving anywhere. He's testing whether you're maturing. This is actually a gut check. You know why? He reveals our character. In this, in this moment of waiting, God reveals our character. He wants to show you areas where you need to grow. Persistent praying, it actually shows my maturity. You say, what do you mean by that, Pastor Phoebe? Okay, I have three boys, so they went through all the stages of, of growing up. If I, tell you, if I tell a toddler, you can have that. Yes, you can have that in a little while. Do they get it? No. If you tell a toddler, not yet, in a little while, he'll give it to you just a little bit. It's a little while. If you tell it to the, the toddler, do they get it? No. You can have it later. Just wait. Do they understand that? No. Typically, what happens when you say that to a toddler, oh, they throw a tantrum, a temper tantrum. Why? That's called immaturity. Toddlers don't know how to wait. Now, here's the point. Let's face it, we're all immature in some areas of our life. Now, immature human beings do not know how to wait. Immature humans want it now, and I want it yesterday. And even though I don't have enough, even though I, I want it now, I want it now. Now, the number one cause of most of your problem and our problem in life is our inability to delay gratification. Let's just face it, we don't really know how to wait. And that's true, not just for people who don't know God, but even for us who follow Jesus. We're in a society that says, I've got to have it now. I've got to have what I want. I want it instantly. I want it fast. I want it at this moment. Now, praying persistently actually tests my maturity. 
Don't you think your Heavenly Father knows what you need more than you do? Of course he does. Knows when you need it? Of course he does. Knows why you need it? Knows the best way you need it? Knows basically how to deliver it? Of course he does. Now here's the point. While you're whining, God is working behind the scenes. God has been working. While you're waiting, God is working on the answer. Sometimes he has to get certain things in our life into place first before he brings the answer. Sometimes they have to align our attitude. Sometimes they have to align our priorities or maybe even our desires before he delivers. Now, patience, folks, is the mark of maturity. Maturity means that you know the difference between a delay and a denial. A delay, my friend, is not a denial. When you grow up, maturity means I learn the difference between wait, not yet, and yes. A delay and a denial. God has said no to your request, but it's going to come in his timing. And I think that's the hardest part that we struggle with. Isn't that right? God wants to meet your need, but he's more interested in growing your character. Growing you to become more like Christ. And friends, one of the characteristics of Christ is patience. The Bible says that patience is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. How do you learn patience? Obviously, by waiting. So the question is, am I going to depend on my feelings or am I going to really depend on God? That is the bottom line. It's part of our development, our spiritual growth are building muscles. Now, let me show you an example of this. In 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 31, God left Hezekiah. He was a king, a very good king. Now, notice it says there in that verse, God left Hezekiah on his own for how long? For a while. Can you imagine that? Why? To see what he would do. God wanted to test his heart. Now, friends, before God answers your prayer for a breakthrough, He's going to test your heart. He's, I've seen it happen in my own life, and I'm experiencing it right now in my own life, right? I believe God is testing my heart. I'm telling you this as a friend. God is going to test your heart before the breakthrough happens, and He wants to, he wants to know, he, he wants to know, are you ready to handle the blessing? Are you, hand, are you ready to handle the breakthrough? And God knows that. Now, we talk, about that, we talk about this during our talk about Daniel. Before every testing, before every blessing is a testing. Now, did you know that God once did this for an entire nation called the nation of Israel? And for those of you who know the story about the Ten Commandments and Moses in Egypt, he had a blessing for them called the Promised Land. But before he let them go to the Promised Land, he wanted to test them. And God says, I'm going to test you. If they, were mo- if they were mature enough, if they were ready enough, if they were responsible enough, they were committed enough to handle the blessing in the Promised Land. He kept them out in the desert. This is an amazing story. I encourage you to read it in the book of Exodus. He kept them in the desert, in the wilderness. They could have gone from Egypt to the promised land in a a matter of weeks or months. But guess what? It took them 40 years. Distance from Egypt to the promised land was only 250 miles, right? Right? If they really walk every day, as as they did, there were no cars, no trains to walk. But here, get this, it might take them months, but it took them 40 years. What were they doing walking around the desert for 40 years? Well, what was God doing to them? Testing them. They were getting tested. Now, here's the cool thing about God, and listen to this. When God tests you, it's not because he wants you to fail. That's a big deal to me. When God wants to tell you, he doesn't want you to die. He doesn't intend to, to make you fail. He wants you to succeed because he wants you to succeed. He'll let you retake the test. I know someone has said, Pastor Phoebe, I failed my driver's test. I'm like, it's okay. DMV has lots of grace. You can take it again. Well, I'd like to say this. The cool thing about God is this. 
when God tests you, He wants you to succeed, so He allows you to retake the test. In 40 years, God gave them seven different attempts. Like you can retry. I give you one test, you fail. Okay, try again, try again. Try. Seven tests. You can test again. God wants to keep you, to, to, God wants you to keep retaking the test until you pass it. Now, here's what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 8 2. The Lord led you through the wilderness for 40 years. Can you imagine? Wow, 40 years. Now, notice the next part of the verse humbling and testing you. Humbling and testing you. Humbling and testing you to prove your character. Remember I said when God is delaying an answer, He's testing your desire, He's testing your priorities, He's testing your maturity. He wants to prove your character. And then notice what the next part of the verse said, and to find out whether or not you would really obey His commands. Now let's just get real honest here. When you're in pain, when I'm in pain, and we cry out to God, either emotional, physical, and, e and even just any kind of pain. You're just uncomfortable and you're bored. And when things aren't right in your life, what we really want is just relief. God, I just want you to remove this pain. Remove all these things in my life, oh God. God, just remove the pain. I just want relief. I'm tired of the pain. I just want relief. We want God to remove the symptom. See, pain is a symptom of something deeper. When God wants to remove our pain, he goes down to the root of it all. God wants to remove the cause. Now, removing the cause takes time, a little bit more time. Let me say it again. When things are not going good in your life, you want God to just make it all happy, put a band-aid on it, soothe it, take it away, God, just take it away. Not clear up the relationship, not deepen your character, not change you. God, we just want, I just want you to change the symptom, change the circumstances, change, change, not change my character, God. Just take it out quickly. We want a quick fix. We want a quick answer. God says, no, I want to do a surgery. I want to cut out that cause of pain in your life. We want to feel the ease in our prayer. God wants to heal the disease the thing that's causing the problem in our relationship, that's causing the problem in our marriage, that's causing the problems in our finances. We want God to just get us, get us out of debt. God says, how about if we work on the cause that you get into it in the first place? If you get out of debt and we don't work on the cause, guess what? The next year, you'll be back on it again. We want to feel the ease. And God says, no, I want to heal the cause. I want to heal the disease. It's a whole different level. So here's a big question I'd like to ask you. When I'm praying for God to do a breakthrough in my life, God, I want to get married. God, I want to get a job. God, I want a, a, a bigger career. God, I want my dream to come true. God wants all those things. Yes, he wants all those things for you. If there a desire, he's put that desire in your life, those things are going to be met. God wants to do those things to be true in your life too. The first question you have to ask yourself is this, am I willing to let God change me first instead of changing my situation, my circumstances? That, my friend, is a whole different issue. Am I willing to let God change me instead of God changing the circumstances? I don't like God to change me. I just like you to change my relationship, change my job. Change, but, but friend, studies have shown in scripture, that is never God's path. God always goes to the root of the problem. This friend is called the point of surrender. The point of surrender happens in every breakthrough prayer. Before the breakthrough happens, if you don't get through this point, I'll let you know this. As much as you've gone through the next five weeks, if you don't get through this point, you're not going to get through the breakthrough. 
Am I willing to let God change me, my attitude, my heart, my character, my worldview, and grow me, grow me up and change me to become more like Christ? Why in the world am I praying for this promotion or whatever else? This is the point of surrender. Now look up in Romans 6.13, it says there, Give yourself completely to God. Be used in the hands of God for His good purpose. That's the point of surrender. That's the point where you want to go. God, this is what I want. But I really want more than anything else. Is God is, I want what you want for my life. I want you to be the center of my desire. And God, if I need to change If I need to have a change of heart, I need a change of attitude and worldview, go ahead, God, change me. I surrender. Finally, do you know what else this does? When you're waiting, when you keep praying and praying and the answer hasn't come, and you keep praying and praying and the answer hasn't been received, that waiting period, this is a test. See, persistent praying tests my faith. Do, do, do I trust my feeling or do I trust my father? Do I really trust God's promise or do I trust what everybody is telling me? It's never going to happen. It's not going to take place. You've been praying for five years. You've been praying for 10 years. It's not going to happen. Now, that's the most precious thing of all, your faith. The real issue, the question here is this. Am I going to trust my feelings? Or am I going to trust what my Father in heaven tells me? I know what God has said. I hear you. I'm going to meet your need. I will meet your need. The answer is on its way. But do I trust my feeling or do I trust what God says? It is a mistake to trust your feeling, my friend. All the sometimes culture tells us, listen to what your heart says. Listen to your inner voice. Well, to tell you the truth, Yes, I listen to my inner voice, but I'll say this, 90%, it's wrong. 90% of the time, it's wrong. Now, in our last message, I said, God will never give you, your Heavenly Father will never give you anything unhelpful or harmful. He will never give you anything that is detrimental or deadly. He will only give you the good things. God made you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what will make you happy more than you know, right? He knows what you need more than you do. Why don't you trust your father, the one who made you, the one who said, I got you, I got your back, I will take care of you, who gave you your first breath and says, I know you, I design you, I shape you. See, God knows what's going to make you happy. This next verse is one of the most familiar verses especially in the Christian circle. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know, God says, the plans I have for you, says the Lord, they are plans for good and not for evil. Plans to give you a future and hope and hope. He says, I have this plans. But you know what happens with the plans? You have to wait. Wait for God's timing. Not all the plans happen overnight. In fact, the bigger God wants to do something in your life, the longer the runway it takes to get it off the ground. When God wants to do something really big in your life, a big breakthrough in your life, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens when you're going down the runway and you are praying, and you are trusting, and you're growing in priorities and maturities and desire, and you're growing in faith, and God says, I'm going to do it. But you've got to wait on my timing. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not get tired, my friend. Let's not get tired of doing what is right for at the right time. I'd like for you to circle that phrase. At the right time, at the proper time, God's timing is perfect. He's never one day late and he's never one day early. It says that at the right time, we will. Notice, it says, it didn't say we might. It says we will reap the harvest of blessing if we don't get discouraged and give up. Your faith, my friend, is more desirable and more important and more precious than anything God could possibly give you. He's already said, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. 
He already said, no good thing he will withhold from those who walk upright. He already said, ask anything in my name and I will be, it, it shall be done. He already said, you have not because you ask not. You are not trying to convince God when you keep praying for it. But in that persistence, God is changing you. He's changing your desires. He's purifying your desires. He's testing your character. He's building your faith. He's strengthening your life. He's doing all things for good in your life. Now, let me end with this. God answers our prayer in four, in four ways. And it's in your outline. I want you to review it real quick. God, there's no such thing as unanswered prayer. He always answers. He doesn't always answer the way we like it, but God answers our prayer all the time, all our prayer. One is when my request is not right, God says no. Second, when, my, when, I am right, when I am not right, God says, you still need to grow. When the timing is not right, God says, wait, slow. But when my requests and timing and character are all lined up, God says, okay, now go. Let's pray. For those of you who are watching this moment, I don't know if you kind of really stayed with us in the last four weeks or five weeks. This could be a breakthrough moment for you. As I pray for you at this time, I don't know what you're waiting on, God. I don't know what you are asking God to do in your life. I don't know what, what, what you're saying, God, I've been praying for this for years. Why aren't you giving it to me? I don't know what that is, but you know. So here's what I'll do. Just where you are right now, just say this, God, you know my needs. You know what I've been waiting for you to, pr to answer. You know all these things, God, before I even ask. Now, God, please change me. Would you work in my character, work in my mindset, work in my attitude, God, maybe even work on my desires. Purify me, God, like gold and silver. God, would you help me to take my moments and my days and surrender them to you? Lord, would you help me to believe and trust you while I am waiting for the answer? God, would you just take my life and shape it and prepare it for the breakthrough that you're going to give me. I call that the prayer of surrender. I, when I was growing up, we used to sing this song back then, I surrender all. And I remember I was so scared to pray that, to sing that song when I was in Bible school. I was like, God, I don't want to sing that song. You might send me in a place where I don't want to. And I would never sing that song from my heart. Here's what I found out. When I hold back in surrendering my all to God, it's not God who misses out, it's me who misses out. And the sad part is this, it was quite late when I found that out. I mean, all through that, I was thinking, man, God, if I learned to surrender my life back then when I was young, I could have accomplished greater things for you. I could have explored all the things that you have given me, but no, I held back. I don't want you to experience that. So regardless of how old you are, how young you are, I challenge you this morning. Learn to say, God, I surrender all to you. I give you my life. I give you my present. I give you my future. And in the meantime, God, as I wait for you, as I wait for my breakthrough, change me inside and out. If you're here this morning and you have never really come to God, you have never really opened your life to God, say this quietly just where you are. It's not a long prayer, but if you pray this from your heart, I promise you this, you're going to experience a change that happens inside. Say this, Jesus Christ, I believe in you. Jesus Christ, I give you my life. That's it. Jesus Christ, I believe in you, and I give you my life. Lord, I, I pray for everyone who prayed that prayer. And as we wrap up our series on seeking you for a breakthrough. I pray that for those of us who are still waiting for that breakthrough, God, do your work in our life. Continue to change us. Continue to align our desires, our priorities, our attitudes, our characters, 
even our worldview, God, our biblical worldview, according to your path. And I pray for those who accepted you in their life, who received you in their life. Today, God, a breakthrough happened in their spirit, and may they experience that. God, only you can do that. So my prayer is that that prayer, that person who prayed to give you their life, would you let them know, God, that something real had taken place? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wow. Again, thank you so much. And I'd like to say for those of you who have been praying for a breakthrough, hey, when that breakthrough happened, let us know. Drop me a line. Just let me know, hey, Pastor BB, this breakthrough happened, man, and I want to rejoice with you and celebrate with you. God bless you all. I'll see you next week. I love you.